So, first, the moment of the object. I, as perception, take myself to be a pure apprehension of the self-identical thing before me. If, in my perceiving, a contradiction arises, I will attribute this to myself, the unstable factor, and not to the thing, the stable, identical factor. Thus, I perceive the thing to be a one, but I also perceive in it a property, e.g. whiteness, which, as a universal, goes beyond the one unique thing, as many things are white. Hence, I did not apprehend the thing correctly when I took it to be a one, but as, in truth, a universal property which exists in many things, the objective essence is now a community of objects. However, I now see the property to be determinate, e.g. white, and hence opposed to and excluding other properties, e.g. black. Hence, what in truth is before me is not a community or continuity, but rather a one that excludes. But now I perceive in the exclusive one many such properties which are indifferent and do not affect one another. Hence, the exclusive one is not such but instead a common universal medium. But I now perceive that the properties, the sensuous universals, white, tart, cubicle, in the object are determinate, independent, and really exclude one another. But this now means that the object, the true, is in fact not a universal medium but rather the single property by itself, which, however, is now not a property or something determinate, for it is now not in a one, nor is it in relation to others. For it can only be determinate, e.g. white, in contrast with others, e.g. black, tart. As Hegel says, quote, as this pure relating of itself to itself, it remains merely sensuous being as such. As this pure relating of itself to itself, it remains merely sensuous being as such, since it no longer possesses the character of negativity or negation." End quote. Hence we are back to the pure being of sense certainty and have left perception altogether. The truth, however, is that since certainty, as we have seen, of necessity transcends itself and passes over into perception. Therefore, we must run through the same cycle again, but in a different way. Next, the second moment of the subject-object one. I now see that I am not just a pure apprehension of the thing, but I am also reflected out of the thing, the true, into myself. I do not just perceive the thing as it is, I also perceive what is my subjective reflection, my contribution or addition to the thing, something which is not really in the thing itself. The thing is still truly self-identical, while myself or consciousness is not self-identical, but returns into itself out of the identity of the thing. So, if I separate the untruth of my reflection from the truth of my perception, I will avoid deception and have the thing truly. So, I first perceive the thing as one. But then I perceive many properties in the thing, which contradicts it as one. Thus, in order to preserve the thing's identity, I regard the diversity of properties as an untruth, as not in the thing, but in me as my reflection. The thing is white because I see it, 
tart because I taste it, etc. So the thing is really one. But it is only one and unique if it is opposed to and different from other things. As a sheer one, it is the same as others. So it really needs properties and determinacy to be distinguished from others. So the thing indeed has properties. It is a universal medium and also of independent properties or matters. Hence, its being a one is my reflection, is subjective, not objective. I put the unity into the thing, e.g., insofar as it is white, it is not tart, etc. The result of this second experience is that not just consciousness, but the object as well shows itself as a pure, manyless one and, and also, of independent properties. The thing is no longer self-identical, but contains in itself an opposite truth. The thing shows itself to perceiving consciousness as one thing, e.g. a one, but at the same time it is reflected back into itself as another thing, an opposite, e.g. a many or also. Finally, the third moment of the subject object two. The object of consciousness is now seen to be contradictory or a duality in one. It is both for itself or independent, having no connection to another as reflected into itself, and also for another as it shows itself to consciousness. The question is, what ploy can perception use to avoid this contradiction, which would destroy it? As a last-ditch effort, perception now claims that, yes, the thing does contain two sides, a diversity within it, but the diversity falls into different things. That is, it is truly for itself, one, and independent with an essential difference or quality of its own. However, it is for another having a diversity of properties, not because of its relation to consciousness, but because of its relation to different things. So it is in opposition, not to itself, but to other things. But as Hegel says, this will not work. Simply put, the thing is only one and independent insofar as it is not in relation to others, but its essential difference puts it in relation to others. It says, in effect, I am different from them. I am not them. Hence, the thing's being is dependent on their being and not being what they are. As Hegel says, quote, the thing is posited as being for itself, Hence, as the absolute negation of all other being, end quote. Hence, the thing is only this relating to others. And this relation is the negation of its being. The object is therefore the opposite of itself. It is for itself insofar as it is for another and vice versa. It is the unity of opposites which is the real truth of perception, and which Hegel will call the unconditioned universal, as well as the concept, infinity, and life. Note that the unconditioned universal that has emerged is a universal of pure self-subsistent thought, whereas the conditioned universal of sense and perception was a universal conditioned by sense, such as whiteness, tartness, and cubicleness. What is of absolute importance is that contradiction, the unity of opposites, is not to be avoided. It is the truth, the true nature of reality, or what is. Thus, we have left the senses and the being of sensuous properties behind us. 
It is thoughts, pure essences, universal abstractions that in truth rule perception and are alone what the sensuous is and reduces to. The goal of perceptual understanding is simply to, quote, bring together these thoughts of universal and singular, also and one, being for self and being for another, and thus take us to understanding the next shape of consciousness, the truth of perception.